as I went to school, I learned that our genome, our human genome, consists of proteins. And these proteins consist of exons and introns. And then between these proteins, we do have so-called garbage. That's what my teacher taught me. And now we understand a little more after having all these high throughput sequencing techniques about our genome. Um, we know that we have these proteins, but they just make a very tiny fraction of our genome. So it's something like one and a half percent. That's what we thought 2007. And now it's corrected to nearly three percent, which means we have something like 97 percent of our genome being garbage. How is that possible? Nowadays, people tend not to use the word garbage anymore because otherwise we would think we are just garbage. So um, people try to understand what are these 97% in our genome. And we understand not too much nowadays, but we understand step by step a little more. So we have a lot of repeating elements in there, signs, lines, but we have also a lot of other fragments in our genome, which is actually interesting because they are transcribed, similar to proteins. So you know about proteins. Proteins are transcribed, then they are processed, still in the nucleus, and then they go into the cytoplasm and there they are translated at the ribosomes. But these other genes, which are also transcribed, they are called non-coding RNAs, or we call them shortly NC RNAs. So this non-coding RNAs it doesn't mean that they are not coding for something. They do have a function and actually a very important function, but they do not code for proteins. So what happens with them? Okay, so we still have polymerases in our nucleus and these polymerases come to our gene, our non-coding RNA genes. These genes are transcribed and then after that they can have various functions, but usually they are not going to the ribosomes and they are not translated into proteins. So what are these genes and what are they doing? Well, nowadays we know quite a lot of them. So some years ago we knew there are these called transfer RNAs, tRNAs, which act for the protein coding RNAs to be translated. Then we knew another class of non-coding RNAs, which are rRNAs, ribosomal RNAs, Actually, this is also important to translate mRNAs into proteins. And maybe some people heard about sNRNAs, these spliceosomal RNAs. They act during the process of processing. Um, they splice, for example, the introns out and the exons together. And apart from that, people didn't know so much about non-coding RNAs some years ago. So nowadays we know much more. So we think there are not only three classes like the tRNAs, the rRNAs and the sNRNAs. Nowadays we at least know two and a half thousand classes which are stored in databases, special databases for non-coding RNAs. Um, but again, what are they doing? So what are, why do we have them? So why our genome consists of these non-coding RNAs. Um, so we try to understand a little more. So one very famous class are the so-called microRNAs. They act in different processes. Um, they are also transcribed again. They are also processed, so they are matured. So there are coming a lot of proteins and a lot of other um, parts within the nucleus still, and they are cut together and shortened that we just have very small acting fragments. Actually, after transcription, they may have a length of 120 nucleotides, so they are not very long, but after processing, they are only in a length of about 22 nucleotides. And these 22 nucleotides are very important. So they go, for example, to the mRNA of messenger RNA, which want to become a protein, but they go to these sites and then these genes are silenced. That means maybe they are not any longer translated, so we don't have a protein afterwards. So it's a very important regulatory mechanism. And most of the non-coding RNAs we know nowadays are actually regulatory RNAs. So what can they regulate? So now you know about the very famous microRNAs regulating the mRNAs by silencing. 
However, they can also act in different ways. They can um, yeah, just help to transcribe during the process with interacting with the polymerase, but they can also have completely different things. So what they do is after transcription, usually they form a so-called secondary structure. So RNAs um, can interact nucleotide by nucleotide, similar to DNA, but different. So DNA, usually you have a C interacting with a G and a T interacting with an A. However, for RNAs, we have the timings replaced by uracil and now we have interactions like GU, which is new, additional to GC and also UA. So we have another possibility to interact and therefore forming a kind of secondary structure has a new flexibility. These secondary structures are important for the function. So if they have the correct structure, they can function somewhere in the cell, either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. If they don't have the correct structure, then they don't function. So this is a very big difference to proteins because for proteins it doesn't matter what secondary structure they have, it only matters what is the sequence of the nucleotides and three, three of these nucleotides are translated into one amino acid. So now we come to the very important bioinformatical part. So how can we detect actually these non-coding RNAs in our genome? So let's assume we have our genome completely. So how can we find in this huge long genome our non-coding RNAs? For proteins this is rather simple because the sequence should remain the same in order to get the function and therefore we just search for the same sequence of nucleotides. This can be done with different algorithms and it is quite easy to achieve a nice result in that aspect. However, for non-coding RNAs this is different, since the sequence doesn't matter that much, but only the structure to gain the function. Um, so we do need actually completely different algorithms and programs to find them. So we may start with something similar to the proteins and try to find something sequence-based. However, that doesn't work very well and so we have to find algorithms being considering our non-coding RNA secondary structure being important for the function. So actually it appears that, for example, a human spliceosomal RNA, let's take U4, um, and we compare that to a chicken U4 SN RNA. So if we try to align them and we lay the sequences below each other, actually the sequences really don't look similar at all. So they really look so different. So how can we actually find them? But if we consider the secondary structure, then we are able to really see similarities and therefore we can assume that the function might be the same. To calculate the secondary structure of a sequence, there are different approaches. So you can do that by um, stochastic methods, but I think the most widely used one is something being similar to what is probably used in nature, which is called we try to gain the minimum free energy out of these molecules. So whenever a molecule is interacting, energy is released. So this is an exothermic reaction. And um, this energy which is released, we think the more energy is released, the more stable is the secondary structure. So probably, that's what people think, the more stable the secondary structure is, the function can be obtained and therefore um, we try to find the secondary structure which has the minimum free energy for that construct. So how to find the minimum free energy for a given sequence then? Um, this is usually done by a dynamic programming approach. So we try to go for all the possibilities, try to estimate or calculate the minimum free energy of this given structure and then we compare and try to find the best one the best minimum free energy and that usually gives us an idea of how a sequence sh could look like in the nucleus and how the secondary structure is formed and what it might look while having whatever function it has. Actually in real it is a bit different because these non-coding RNAs are also interacting with proteins. However 
In Silico, it is not possible nowadays to predict how a non-coding RNA or an RNA in general is actually interacting to a protein because we don't know anything about the interactions of RNAs and proteins. So this will be definitely a challenge in the future to find out how RNAs and proteins are interacting. Now we know more about how we try to find non-coding RNAs in the genome. However, it is still quite hard because what we know so far is if we go into a lab and we find a non-coding RNA, which is not translated, then it is possible from this organism to search by homology search, by yeah, also considering the secondary structure, some other non-coding RNAs and other organisms. However, what happens if you do not know anything about these non-coding RNAs? And this appears now since a few months or years. We now know there are also so-called long non-coding RNAs. So long non-coding RNAs have by definition a length of more than 200 nucleotides. They can range more than 10 kilobases and they can in usually also include introns which are actually also spliced out. And these long non-coding RNAs are sometimes antisense to proteins where they interact to. However, they can also just act in cis to somewhere in the genome. These long non-coding RNAs are hard to find because its secondary structure is interrupted by the introns. So finding them is even a harder challenge. So what we usually do is we go for the high throughput sequencing data. So we try to find out um, what is transcribed to a certain time point in the cell. And this we can sequence, we can map it back to the genome and then try to find out what parts of the genome are not proteins but still transcribed. So that might be possible non-coding RNAs. And after mapping this back, we can nowadays find long non-coding RNAs as well. However, their function still remains unclear from a bioinformatical point of view. And then we have to go back into the lab and try to find a function.